Okay. Um, thanks. So yeah, speaking of flexibility and grace, um, I have had a crazy week. So I am using slides that the last person made. I have not really edited these. I'm going to ad lib my way through this as best as possible, but I did um, read through the chapter and have some thoughts. So when in doubt, could just go back to the text itself if that ends up being easier. Um, let me just pull this up. Okay. So I thought this was a really interesting chapter and it was especially interesting that they, um, of like sort of how they chose to organize the information. Um, I didn't expect that we were going to be talking about like the stat stuff in, in this chapter. Um, but then once they started explaining how that all fit together, I was like, oh, I kind of understand things a little bit more. So in this chapter, we talk about understanding ggplot layers, how to control those layers, and then some applications of um, of those, that layering process to real data. Um, so in this in these particular slides, the person decided to use data from the spatial epi package, which is not something I'm familiar with, but I think it's uh, leukemia cases. And the reason they chose to use this is because it's got some latitude and longitude as well as number of cases. Um, so the first thing that the chapter pointed out is that typically when we're making ggplots, we always like add a geome in, in most of the examples we've done in this, in this, uh, book so far it's been like you know the ggplot call and then immediately plus geome something and that kind of skips over the fact that you can make the plot with literally just or you can make a plot right with literally just the ggplot line itself but it creates a blank plot which is kind of interesting to me um, i teach the carpentries uh, data um, with our workshop and it, it teaches plotting in the same way where it um explains how to build up the plot layer by layer by first starting with just the ggplot call and being like, okay, why don't we see anything on this plot? What do you think is going on? So I was familiar with um, this concept from that. So doing that just sets up the axes and the labels and the grid, but it doesn't actually put anything on the axes because we don't know, we haven't told ggplot what we want um, to actually add. And then the second layer adds um, a geome. So in this case, adding geome point and I think the thing to point out here is that we are inheriting the data argument from the previous uh, and the aesthetics from the previous line of code as well. So that's being passed on to the geom point line. Um, so then this was new to me. Um, when we add a layer to a ggplot, what's happening under the hood is there's actually a function called layer, which then has a whole bunch of different wrappers um, all the geom functions and the stat functions are wrappers to this layer function, which is nice because it means we don't have to type this out every single time. But seeing this really helped me because um, I think I've encountered things like position or stat or inherit.aes. All these all these things have come up when I've like Googled, oh, how to do a particular thing in ggplot. But I didn't realize that they were the reason they're all there is that these are all possible arguments to every um, layer that you might want to add. Um, and I think having this menu is um, is really helpful. One common theme that I've noticed with ggplot, and I'm curious if you all agree with this, is that um, the words can be really hard to remember. Uh, like it's hard to remember what things are called, and that's because they make a lot of sense once you understand the grammar of graphics, like once you understand that this is a layer and a layer can have a geome and it can have a stat and it can have like a position, then you're like, oh, now I can see that this would go in this layer. But typically that's not how you're learning it. Most people are not reading this book cover to cover when they're first coming to ggplot. So they're just, they have no understanding of why things go where they go and why things are called what they're called. So this, that was the case with me and this was really helpful for me. Um, okay, so the, they, I thought that they gave, okay, well, they didn't maybe give us an explicit example of this, but I just wanted to point out, we have this layer function. So this P plus geome point, the equivalent of this would be P plus layer parentheses geome equals point. Um, and you can always do either of those 
situations. Um, typically, the geo point, this will be clearer as to what's going on. But you could, if you wanted to, just switch to using the layer function for absolutely everything that you ever wanted to add. OK, um, the next thing we talked about was how data can differ in the plot. And typically, when we talk about ggplots, um, we're using just one single data set that's either passed in with a pipe or it's passed as the data argument to the initial ggplot call and then it's inherited by the subsequent layers. But they pointed out here that you can actually have different data sets for different layers of your plot. I also found this part really validating because I do this a fair bit and I always feel a little bit like I'm doing something wrong. And I think the reason that I feel like I'm doing something wrong is that when people are coming from base R to ggplot, they often tend to try to do this, where they're going to add a single layer for each color, for example, or a single layer for each like level of a factor. And while that technically works, it completely misses the point of what the grammar of graphics is supposed to be about. And the book makes a point that you need to transform, like ggplot requires that all data be transformed to tidy format before you put it into um, your plot, which is an opinionated way of doing things, but it also ensures that every um, command will function in a predictable way. And so I've always spent like a lot of time massaging my data to get it into exactly the right single data frame format for ggplot. And then whenever I do end up needing to add another one, it always feels like, oh, I've messed up in some way. But I think they were showing that, you know, it's very reasonable to create summaries and add those as, as different layers. So in this case, data um, was our uh, was our data set about leukemia cases from the previous slide. And here we are um, adding a different data set, joining by census tract so we can get some more information about the geography. Um, and then we can use this later on. They don't have a good example of that, but I think we will see some in a little bit. Um, yeah, comment, getting, yes, getting a lot, right. Yeah, so getting your data in tidy format helps a lot. Um, and people often don't realize that. And um, yeah, and I think it's worth distinguishing between um, sort of the wrong reasons for adding different data sets on layers and the right reasons for adding data sets on different layers, where like the wrong reason would be your data is untidy and you should have transformed it. Whereas the right reason would be you need to add a summary layer, for example, that requires the calculation of some statistic that occurs at a different, a fundamentally different level where like the observation is no longer the same as the observation in the data. Um, but that's a pretty subtle distinction for people, I think. Um, okay, so then they started talking about um, the statistical transformations that are happening under the hood with ggplot, and they had this really interesting example um, of geom smooth to sort of help us understand how the layers work. So in this case, we're fitting a LOS model to the data, and I actually don't know, is anyone familiar with like how a LOS model works statistically? Like I understand that it creates a squiggly line that basically tracks a moving average, but I don't know what the parameters are. I've never actually fit this as a statistical model. Has anyone done that? Okay, well, anyway, you do this apparently. Um, it's it's not a linear model, it's a LOS model. And I, I would assume you can parameterize like something about the window size or something, but we're not doing that. So in this step, they're trying to basically reconstruct by by hand what would be created with geom smooth. So they create the lowest model and then they generate some fake data. So they're making a um, fake data set called grid, which has population sizes ranging from the minimum of the existing data frame to the maximum of the existing data frame um, along regular intervals. And then they use that grid to predict the value for each of those population sizes onto the model that they just created. So this data frame grid now contains um, predicted data values and we'll be able to make a line using that. Um, so just to show what this looks like, this is gonna be our data that we're gonna use here in grid. Um, they also did an example where they isolated some outliers. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but the point is that you can build statistical models separately, um, save that information, 
and then um, add a new layer with um, the data being a different data set. And so in this case, what's happening here is that the um, initial ggplot layer has df being the data, the data set. And I think as we learned in a previous chapter, um, that's the argument name is data, but because it's the first argument, we don't have to say data equals df, but we could if we wanted to, but in this case, just df. And then geom point, this inherits the data from this layer. And then we add a geom line layer um, with the data as it is in the grid data frame. So now we are rejecting the data argument here, and then we're adding um, additional an additional data argument. So the way that inheritance works is that it goes from top to bottom. So the, the top layer is going to control um, what's below it. But then if you were to specify the data set in an individual layer itself, then that doesn't get inherited. So it gets inherited from the top level ggplot layer downward, but not within the, um, the layers. And if there had been another aesthetic here, like if we had done a mapping, a color mapping here, for example, which we'll talk about in a little bit uh, later in this chapter, that would have still gotten inherited because it wasn't like, unless it's overwritten. In this case, color is overwritten by something else. So a bad example, but if we had put like a fill aesthetic and then we did not add a fill aesthetic here, then that would still apply to that layer. So this is what it would look like if we add that line. So again, that's manually generating the lowest smooth and adding it as a second layer with a different data set. And then here's what it would look like if we did the same thing, adding the lowest smooth um, with geom underscore smooth, which is um, which corresponds to stat smooth. So you can see that it's pretty much the same thing. Uh, in this case, we made the line a little bit thicker, but that is exactly what's happening under the hood. I found that really helpful. Um, Okay, yeah. So Gabby has more information about Lois smoothing. Do anybody have questions or thoughts on this idea of adding different data sets in their own layers here? So I I find it interesting that when you do this kind of overriding with data in your geome, you have to explicitly state data equals the actual data itself or it will error. And I think that trips people up sometimes. We just ran into this uh, in a class that I was teaching last night where we're talking about adding layers and mm -hmm. adding layers here with the data equals grid kind of tri trips people up. I know it's a really minor thing, but. No, that's, they actually call that out in the chapter. Um, and I'm I'm trying to remember where they have that um, data to do, 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 do. Yeah, so they, they specifically discuss that okay yeah note that you need to add the explicit data equals in the layers but not in the call to ggplot the argument order is different it's a little inconsistent but it reduces typing for the common case so i think this is a a call that they made very specifically because they realized that it was going to be pretty unusual to add data in layers but it was going to be very typical to have it be um to have the aes be the first argument um of uh, yeah, of, of layers. So it is confusing, but um, it is something they're aware of. But yeah, I hear you on that. And actually, I will tend to, I often kind of obfuscate it for myself um, because I tend to not, sorry, my, my Zoom windows are getting in the way right this second. Um, going back to the slides. Um, yeah, so when I am creating plots, um, I usually don't do this, actually. I will usually mm. put, I'll usually put the data set first and then pipe it into ggplot. I don't know why, but that just like makes more sense to my brain. So I usually avoid the, and then when I do put it in here, I'm usually stating data equals anyway. Um, so it had never stood out to me as a problem, but I hear you that if you're used to this syntax, this must be really weird. It's really confusing to new like people who are learning mm -hmm. the grammar of graphics of like why do I have to explicitly state my data here if I'm doing that? But it's just yeah, I well, just so I brought I, it up because it came up last night when I was teaching. But yeah, go ahead. Sorry. I'm curious about that actually because I think that this adding a second data set in a new layer strikes me as kind of an advanced 
topic? Like, I feel like most beginners, I'm curious how it came up. Like what, what layer was the person trying to add? And was it one of those cases where they were kind of doing it for the wrong reason? Like, were they trying to add a layer because they were trying to mimic a base plot and they, that could have been solved by tidying their data and not having to add a separate layer with a different data set? Or were they actually adding a separate data set for one of these like summary reasons that's the suggested use case of ggplot? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I see what you're saying with that. So like where it came up, so like geom text, adding an mm -hmm. annotation, right? And so- Ah, uh, yep, okay, that's a legit case, yeah. So like you just wanna label, you wanna use like the data frame or you wanna use a data frame to add a label through geom mm -hmm. text. And so like you do some wrangling code up top first to like create that, to create that tidy data set with that label. Mm -hmm. And then you use that data set in here. Like yeah. the one way you could do this is you could do like filter it here. Like you could add a filter statement in mm -hmm. like in this data, like grid, pipe, filter, whatever to get what you want. Sure. But adding the like the wrangling code inside of like the geom plot right. stuff. Just, right. Which just, I've done. Sometimes that's like super not. advanced. That's gross. Yeah, that's that's. And I think I'm actually being too. I'm realizing I'm being probably too harsh in using the word legitimate or non-legitimate usages because like people can ultimately code however they want um i guess what i'm trying to say is like whether the use is consistent with the grammar of graphics or not consistent with the grammar of graphics but yeah i think mm -hmm. that the that's a, actually a really great example that i think this chapter probably should have brought up because i don't know about you all but my first encounter with needing to add a different data set was annotations and I remember being kind of annoyed because all the plots up until then, I had like gone to such trouble to transform my data in a way that I wouldn't need more than one data set. I like made it all nice and tidy. And then I remember when I arrived at annotations and I was being told that like the correct way to do this is you actually have to create another data set. And I remember thinking like, what really is that? Like, is that actually what I have to do? Um, so I think it would be a useful example to have in this chapter because it's probably a lot of people's first encounter the other thing that i would like to pinpoint based on your um, discussion which was actually great i love that example colin um but i think that we have to remember obviously there are different ways of doing the same thing right i call it like your style but something that john has always um said and i agree with this is that you have to remember that we are coding for us for future us but also you may be coding for someone else to check out your code either if it's a co-worker if, if it's a publication then for you know other researchers once you make your uh, code public so it has to be readable yeah. having said that if you make it too convoluted inside all the ggplot and then you do transformations inside it then it may not necessarily be as readable as if you do like for example like the one that you were just talking about like the data frame then ggplot and then you start putting things inside i think that that's readable or if you do it like like it shows here right like the ggplot data frame inside it and then all the other things as long as it's readable and easy to understand i think we are good because um when things get to i don't know like you have functions inside functions and inside the ggplot sure it works but is it readable for others i don't know so i'm just leaving that out there you know that's a great point and that the the book also makes the point that if you do a lot of transformations within the plot it's not repeatable um and i've definitely fallen into that trap where I'm like, oh, I just need to filter this data set to get a subset <laughs> of it for this one plot. So I might as well do it in the same pipeline leading up to the plot. And that works great until I need to then make another plot with the same subset of data and have to do the filtering again. So then I usually go back, rewrite the code, make an actual subset, save it as a variable. So yeah, good point about that. Yeah. Um, so do you mind if I share my screen for a second? Because I think sure, I've, got a, yeah. I've got a fun example of that I think answers one of our kind of questions, but also shows about the like unique coding styles. So um, I think you should have permission. Yeah, okay. Cool. Do yeah. So this is this is from my PhD thesis. Could you zoom and, in a little bit? It's pretty small. Yeah. Um I am not sure I know how to zoom in on. Oh, there it is. It works. 
Did you write your manuscript in R Markdown or Quarto? I love that for you. I did. That's amazing. I I've was been wanting feeling, to do I was that, but my co-authors keep like wanting me to do it in Google Doc. Um, yeah, so first thing is we were talking about how you have to do data equals if you're doing a geom, like if you're changing the data in the geom, you don't actually, as long as you put the aesthetics first. So I actually, because I was just like jankily self-teaching myself how to use ggplot when I was writing my thesis, I actually never put basically anything in the ggplot call. I always just put ggplot blank. And this might be because I'm often using multiple data sets in the same plot, because what I do is I'll plot the points of a raw data set, which I'm doing here, and the the slot tigers, that's the, the data set. So I haven't done data equals. Um, and then I'm also plotting a fit curve on top of that raw data. So that's like my general use case. And I, I think because of that, I just like never put anything in the ggplot call because I was always like having to specify new aesthetics and stuff anyways. Um, so yeah, you can see like I've done G on point, I've done a couple stat functions, um, a whole bunch of stat functions <laughs> because I was this estimating wild. multiple, uh, um, I was doing multiple models, like plotting them all. Um, and you can also see where I have done the really, the thing we were just talking about not doing of filtering my data in the ggbot call. <laughs> So, yeah. so I don't I don't think it's like a no no kind of thing. No. It's more that as long as it's understandable, then you're okay. And the other thing that we have to say here is that anyway, we're taking too much time on this, but the other yeah. thing is that you have to remember that you're gonna have your own style of coding and I'm gonna have my own style of coding. Um so at the end of the day, it's like if you are used to doing the filter in here. As long as you're consistent along the entire, let's say you did this for your per publication and you put it, you know, a series of scripts and everything in GitHub and in, I don't know, Zenodo or somewhere else, then as long as it's consistent and you can see the same way of coding across the entire scripts and all of them, then I think that that's okay. People will understand it um, and also add comments, right? And that that's going to be also useful. For me, I do all the filtering, all of that outside. And then I feed that to ggplot, but that's maybe that must, that's my style. Um, because I think that ggplot is just, it should only have things that have to do with the graph, right? Like all of those other things are tidy in data that should be outside. That's how my brain works. But that doesn't mean that I don't understand what you just wrote there because I know tidy yeah. and I know ggplot. So I understand it. So I, I, so, like I said, as long as it's readable, I think you're okay. And in doubt, if, if in doubt, add comments. <laughs> Just to explain. Yeah. Right? But I, yeah, so I think you're, it's okay. It's your style. I think it's too. fine. It was also like I was writing my thesis in, you know, like three weeks and was just like, I make things work and that's it. So, like, future me, which is current me, has to go back yeah. and translate that mm -hmm. into, like, proper um proper coding that is understandable by everyone else <laughs> yeah and we can't let the perfect be the en enemy of the good so i think you know whatever works um all right so i'm going to go back to the part about aesthetics and i'm actually i didn't love the slides for this part so i'm gonna share the um book part for this so the next thing they talked about is um specifying the aesthetics and the plot versus the layers. And I'm gonna go a little fast through this because I think we already discussed this a little bit, but um, just showing that you can put the AES call in the actual ggplot function, or you can put it in the geom point function. And if you have a plot with one layer, that doesn't matter. Um, but if you have a plot with more than one layer, it does matter because if it's the same aesthetics, you're gonna be repeating yourself a lot if you don't put them in the ggplot call. And if it's different aesthetics, it's really important to put them in the layer itself. So they mentioned that all of these calls create the exact same plot. 
In this case, we have the aesthetics all up there. In this case, we have some of the aesthetics up here, but then we have an additional aesthetic down here and then like same here and same here. And so all of these create the same plot, but then once we start adding more layers, it's gonna be different. Uh, so the um, uh, example that they gave here is that I thought was really good is these are two different plots. They're both completely valid, but they focus on completely different aspects of the data. And I've, I don't know about you all, but I've done both of these plots. And actually sometimes I might wanna do both. Like sometimes I want the left-hand one with the individual slopes for each group. And then I might wanna overlay like a dashed black line or something to show the overall slope of the trends. Um, and so to get the first plot, we put our color aesthetic in the overall ggplot call, and then we use geom smooth geom point. So geom point is going to inherit the color mapping, and then geom smooth is also going to inherit the color. And when geom smooth inherits um, color for a categorical variable like that, it will take the hint basically to create more than one linear regression and to use that as a um, as a um, categorical predictor in the linear model that it creates. So that's how we get this plot with different slopes. And then by moving the color equals class down to just the geom point aesthetic, that means that geom smooth is going to ignore it because it doesn't inherit from the layer immediately previous. And so it just gives us an overall slope. Um, so this is something that I kind of knew already, but I think it was really helpful to show side by side uh, the difference here. Um, okay, let me go back to the slides. Uh, okay, so mapping versus setting an aesthetic. And this is another place where people who are coming from base R get really confused, I think. Um, but it is one of ggplot's best features. And it's one that, you know, we should make sure we explain to folks. Um, I think it was the, the most confusing thing in my experience teaching ggplot is that people come to it and they're like, how do I change the colors? And when your answer isn't you type blue, green, and red in quotation marks, when your answer becomes something like, well, first you have to tell ggplot to color by a variable. And then later on you set colors. I think people are a little bit thrown by that, but it is um, really important and useful. So let's discuss setting versus mapping. So to map an aesthetic to a variable, um, that is when we put the, um, the name of the variable inside the AES parentheses. Um, and so the way I would translate this is, um, or the way, the way that I try to explain this to people typically is when we have our AES that contains things like the X and the Y, and it also contains things like the color or the fill. And people are like, wait, why do those all go in the same place? Either, you know, why is X an aesthetic or why is color something that's as fundamental as the X and the Y? And the way to think about it is um, that this is saying which variable is getting mapped to each of those like dimensions. So we're saying we assign such and such variable to the X dimension, we assign such and such variable to the Y dimension, and then color is a dimension, right? And so we're saying we wanna put this variable, uh, like assign values of this dimension according to this variable, map the values to the values of the variable. Versus if we put something like color equals red, outside of the AES call, now we're not doing any mapping. We're just brute force telling ggplot that the color of all our points should be red. So that's where the color might not have a lot of meaning in and of itself. I mean, okay, it, it totally could, but like that's when you might be changing the color just to change the color as opposed to setting the color to follow the values of a particular variable. Um, okay, so the other thing that they um, talked about, the other example that they gave that I thought was kind of funny was you could theoretically, and we'll talk about this more in the scales chapter, I think, you could theoretically do this. So you could put AES color equals dark blue in quotes, um, which probably some of you have done this in the past and been confused why it didn't work. Like, why are my points showing up in red when I told them to show up in dark blue? 
And that's because under the hood, um, ggplot creates a new variable called dark blue, and it only has one value. So it picks like the first color value in its scale. And that happens to be that pinkish red. Um, and so that confuses people. But then if you, for some reason, wanted to force it, you could then add scale color identity, which then goes back to interpreting the value of the variable literally. And this is a really silly example for something like this with one color, like what a roundabout way to color your points dark blue. But if you, the reason, the instance where this would not be roundabout is if you have a data frame that already contains a column with like the literal names of colors, you've already done the work of figuring out which color you want to go with which um, variable or which, which like data row or something. And you would like ggplot to interpret that color com that color column literally. In that case, adding scale color identity, and you'd probably do something like color equals not in quotes name of the column containing the color, but then scale color identity would force it to literally use those values to color the points. I've never done that, but I could see it being um, pretty useful in some cases. Um, so if more than one GeomSmooth is used in the plot, um, you could, uh, you could specify it. Um, oh yeah, this was a weird one. So in this case, they took advantage of the um, the fact that the color legend will end up being labeled with the variable that you're coloring by to end up with different GM smooth colors. So they specified a color equals low S or color equals LM. Um, and then those two each got their own value, but then they used the scale color Veritas to put those two values on the Veritas scale. And instead they probably just could have removed the aesthetics and said color equals purple or color equals yellow, but then that wouldn't have given a legend. Um, that's probably poorly explained. I barely understood this part. Um, it was a bit roundabout. Did anybody? Oh, you have done this a bunch. Can you explain more about this, Ashley? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've done it in exactly the context that you were talking about at the end there, where I wanted to make sure that the legend specifically talked about that variable. So I've done it. Um, I was comparing the... I was... Also, if we have time at the end, I can actually show the example. But basically, I was comparing... A, a growth curve that was estimated from bone histology to actual growth in lions in this particular example. Um, and I wanted to make sure that the legend called out histology versus observational. And this was just the way that I, you know, found, figured out how to do it. There, there is probably another way to do it that is like more elegant, but yeah, because the way that I would have thought to do that, and this may or may not work for your data set, depending on if, if they look super different. What, but what I always do, because I had no idea this was an option, was to, you know, bind those data sets together and create a column that's like source or, or like, you know, type and where the values are either histology mm -hmm. or yeah. the other thing. Right. And then use then map the color to that. But like now I'm realizing that that might be more steps than this. And this actually could be just an easier yeah. way. I'm also not sure that would work if in this case, one of your, um, one of the data sets that you're mapping is based on a function, like the geom smooth. You're right, yeah, if they had completely curve. different yeah. columns. Good point, good point. Yeah. yeah, this is really, I'm, I'm glad that you're on this call because doing this sort of like multiple statistical transformations on the same plot is like not something that I've really had to do very much. So it's um, it's great to hear from you because you do this frequently. Okay, bye Colin, we will see you next week. All right, um, okay, so geomes. Uh, we have already seen a lot of geomes um, and they require different aesthetics. Some of them only require an X, for example, histogram doesn't need a Y because the Y uh, gets gets inferred from the statistical transformation. Um, here is an example of a plot that uses three different geomes, geom quantile, geom point, and geom rug. Um, I'd actually never used geom quantile before, so I think that's really cool. 
Um, but the thing, again, I'm not loving these slides and I'm sorry, I didn't have a chance to, um, to fix them up. I will do that after, but I wanted to go down. I wanted to jump down to this part because the, the text links to this and I, I made the jump when I was reading and I thought this was really helpful. We'll talk about stats in a little bit, but I found it helpful to explicitly notice that there are direct correspondences between statistical transformations and some of these geomes. And I think this can be really confusing for people coming to ggplot because like we talked about in the earlier chapters of this book, we have individual geomes, we have collective geomes, and we have statistical summaries. And um, they're all called geome, right? It, it, it might be more clear if it was like, you know, three different functions, one for individual geomes, one for collective geomes, and one for statistical geomes. But some of the geomes, um, like geome point, they don't do any additional summaries under the hood. But then other geomes, like geome box plot, it's calculating a five number summary, and then it's using that to draw the box plot. You can't do a box plot without doing that calculation. And so I thought it was neat to see that like, okay, these are the mappings like stat box plot, you probably won't ever use directly, but you could. And that's what geom box plot is like built on top of. Um, stat bin is, is used for all these different geoms that use the, uh, that, that need bins in order to work in order to be drawn at all, right? So I thought that was um, really important. There's also a couple other stats that, that don't have a geom function uh, that we'll get to in a little while. Um, sorry, I'm still getting lost in my controls. Yeah, the rug plot is interesting, Ashley. I mean, I've seen this before a little bit. It shows the data density. I've also seen this done with um, sort of uh, density plots on each axis. Like, oh, you know, here there would be like a like a curve that goes whoop, um, and then over here, something like that to help you see. Um, it's another way of dealing with overplotting, but I've never used one myself. It kind of looks like a barcode. I'm going to skip the exercises in the interest of time, but definitely would suggest doing them if they uh, if you want to practice these a little bit more because they're quite interesting. OK, so stats. Um, there's a bunch more statistical summaries that I didn't just go over, which I also would love to do, like stat ECDF. I have needed this so many times, and I have always calculated it manually with like cumulative sum, and it's such a pain. Um, and so I'm really, really glad this exists. I didn't know this existed. I would love to start using it. Um, stat summary. Okay. So here is. Um, Another example, so it's a pretty classic thing to want to put like a mean on the box plot and be like, how do you do that? And so in this case, they're using stat summary and they're specifying geom equals point. And then they're specifying which function to use. This is again, it's, it's probably pretty unintuitive for anybody who's approaching um, ggplot for the first time because your brain isn't thinking of it as, let me add a statistical summary, which is the median. Instead, your brain is thinking of, I just want to add the median. So you would like look for a median function first. But in fact, the way you have to approach it is you go first summary and then tell it which summary you want. So in this case, they've added the median and the mean. And um, I want to point out that they did this using two different syntaxes, and these are both valid syntaxes. So in this case, stat summary with geom equals point is how they did it. And in this case, they did geom underscore point with stat equals summary. So this goes back to our layer function. Um, I'm pretty sure if I'm understanding it correctly, both um, stat summary and geom point are wrappers of the underlying layer function with all these different um, arguments, geom, stat, and you can pick which one you'd like to use. And then you can specify all the other arguments. Um, so in this case, yeah. medians and means, close, but not the same. Uh, and they put them with different colors and different sizes. Questions about um, stat stuff? Oh, actually, yeah, before we take questions about stat stuff, let me, let me, sp let me talk about the after stat thing. This is another really good example of like, what the heck is this wording? 
I don't know about you all, but I had encountered after stat before somebody had told as like a response to a stack overflow question or something like, you know, oh, how do I do this thing? And I was like, why is it after stat? What does that even mean? That makes no sense. And now I understand that it's because when a statistical summary is calculated under the hood, just like we saw with the lowest smooth, there has to be a data frame generated um, in order to plot that statistical summary. It's, it's just that ggplot is doing it for you instead of you doing it manually. And so that data frame that's generated has automatic column names and somehow you can find out the automatic column names. That was one question that I have is, where's a resource that I can find out the structure of the data frame that each statistical summary generates under the hood that I'm not actually able to see? Um, so maybe we can talk about that in a second. But once you know the names of the columns in the data frame, you can then use those. So for example, geom. Um, actually, here, pop quiz. Does anybody remember which stat uh, is called under the hood by geom histogram? What was the name of the stat function? Gabby, you're muted. Um, stat bin. Yeah, I think it's I think it's just bin, not binned, but I'm, I'm not positive about that. But yes, it's the one that bins the data. So it calculates, um, it must create a data frame. I'm not sure the structure of the data frame, but we know that the structure of the data frame has a column called density. And so we're able to use that as a variable in creating a plot, but we have to specify after stat because that variable doesn't exist until the statistical transformation has happened. Uh, the variable only exists once we have that data frame that's been created. They also point out in the chapter that this is important because what if your original data has a variable called density that means something completely different? We have to be clear that we're talking about the one that's in the generated data. Um, I did not super understand this part. Did anybody understand why they were using, like what was the purpose of making this plot using density as opposed to count, it just changes the y-axis and I didn't quite understand why they wanted that. Everybody was confused about this. They, I'll go back to the book where they, where they discussed it. Um, so here they said, for example, the default geom histogram assigns the height of the bars to the number of observations, count, but if you prefer a more traditional histogram, you can use the density. What is a more traditional histogram? To me, this is a traditional histogram. Um, so I think they're talking about how you manually do a histogram. So the way they do it is there is a density function, um, which is very long. Um, you can Google it, you know, and you'll find it like a, what is the density function used to create a histogram and essentially what it's doing is just saying that everything under the curve or everything under that uh, histogram is going to sum to one so that is that is essentially what it's doing so the count one everything under is gonna when you add all of those values like for example the first one is like what eight thousand or something so all of those, when you add them up, it's gonna add, it's gonna sum the total of your values. I don't know, twenty thousand or whatever. But with okay, the density, got it. everything adds to one because they use this density function uh, to do that. Right, and geom density also does that, but then geom density uses a curve instead of a histogram. So this is like if you wanted a density function, but have it be a histogram. Um, yeah, okay, that's really helpful. And then they they talk about comparing multiple groups of different sizes here. Oh yeah, okay, now, now I get it a little bit more. So if you do a um, geom freak poly with um, counts, it's gonna look like this because of the very different sizes of the groups. But if you do, do geom freak poly with densities, you're comparing apples to apples with the different group sizes. Okay, cool. Um, all right, back to the slides. Um, so then there are again some exercises, which I'm going to skip because we are almost out of time. 
Um, okay, position adjustments. So position is really important for some geoms. I've never used position nudge, but that's when you're when you want to shift, for example, points all by the same amount in the same direction by a small amount. Position jitter, I have used. Um, I've actually used it typically with like geom jitter, but um, you can also use position jitter for, for for being more specific to jitter points by a little bit. Jitter dodge, I've never used, but I could also see that being useful with multiple groups. They can all be used inside the geom. This one I've used more frequently. So with um, geom bar, you can have um, the default, which is position equals stack, which will stack the different groups on top of each other. You could also use position equals fill um, to fill up the entire um, height of the bar, which will give you basically um, percentage or like um, proportion fills, which I would prefer if that were called like position equals proportion or something, but oh well. And then position equals dodge, another one that I've used a lot with multiple groups, if you would like the groups to be side by side and not stacked. Um, and this also goes for something like box plots or um, points or like any other thing. I'm not sure if all geoms can take all positions. Maybe for some of them, it just doesn't make as much sense, but for various ones, you can do that. Um, it's worth noting as well that a use case for this that I've seen come up a couple times is when people want to, like, let's say they've made a plot like this where they've used position equals dodge for the bars or perhaps for box plots. And then they're adding means or medians as a separate geom point layer and they don't know how to get it to like dodge by the same amount because they don't realize they have to also put position dodge in the geom point layer to get the points to dodge by the same amount or um, so that the means will match up to their respective groups that doesn't happen automatically i should have incorporated an example of that and i think if i have time i'm going to go back and edit these slides and i'll incorporate an example of of using position equals dodge. You can also specify the width of the dodge, um, how much you want it to shift. And you would have to make sure those two things matched if you had different layers. Oh yeah, here we go. Here's an example of position jitter um, and we're telling how much to jitter by. Um, and I think this is because uh, DISPL is like, is maybe as a, um, categorical variable, I'm actually not sure. And then we're jittering the points to avoid overplotting. Um, geom count is one that I have never used. This is an example that I see a lot where they map point size to um, to size of, uh, point size to, to count. And I've never actually needed to use that in my own work, but I think it's a, it's a good example as well. I'm using scale size area too. Okay, that's the end of the slides. Let me just go through the chapter and figure out if there were any other things I wanted to highlight. Oh, so the chapter also highlights that um, there's also position identity, which is typically not useful for bars because they just overlap each other, but is useful for lines. If you have something like this where you don't want, um, you know, there's those charts. What's the name of the chart where it's an area chart, but they all layer like layers of sediment on top of each other? Does anybody remember the name for that type? I can't hear you. Isn't it just like a like a frequency poly polygon or wait polygraph? Anyways, uh, or a density plot, but with but stacked. Isn't it position? Yeah, stacked? I like guess it. I guess it is. Name. Um, Maybe yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I think there is a technical name for it, but yes, that's that's what it would be. It would be position equals stack. But the example they're giving here is that we don't want these lines to be, like we want these lines to just be um, where they actually are instead of um, adjusted upward because this is not a cumulative thing. Yeah. Um, cool. Um, I think that was the, yeah. So that's that's pretty much what they went over in the chapter. Was there anything else? I guess we only have two minutes. Any final thoughts? Okay, well, thanks for bearing with my somewhat disorganized slide situation today.
Um, I thought this chapter was actually really useful because it did a combination of cementing things I already knew, but like giving them more theory behind them and then also introducing stuff that I didn't know. Um, so personally, really, really enjoyed this chapter. Um, yeah. And yeah. I, I almost wish this chapter, like the grammar stuff was earlier on. I agree. <laughs> yeah. In fact, yeah. Why doesn't this come? This should come after chapter five. It should go individual geomes, collective geomes, statistical summaries, building a plot layer by layer. Maps, networks, and annotations and arranging should be at the end, I think. Yeah. Or even like, honestly, I'd be fine with like integrating maybe the individual geoms, collective geoms and statistical summaries in like maybe taking this, like build a plot layer by layer, like have a section mm -hmm. of grammar and like integrating those three chapters into yeah. this or like having separating them out into different chapters or something. I agree. I just, I don't know. Maybe it's just like the way my brain works. Like I just, I, I'd like to know like knowing the layer stuff, I think specifically like the fact that geom and stat is just a wrapper around layer, like mm -hmm. that really helped me understand what ggplot does. <laughs> yeah, in fact, I'm looking at this outline, it makes no sense to me. Why did we jump to maps and networks and annotations and arranging it so early? Like what? I, yeah, yeah, it definitely should be like layers and grammar should be the first thing. <laughs> And then like other fancy stuff should be at the end and then scales. Yeah, I think it should go getting started and then like layers and grammar and then scales and then advanced topics and advanced topics should include maps, networks and annotations and arranging. I don't know. Yeah, Whatever. Definitely. We should networks make a PR. I remember when we were like doing networks and a lot of it is like additional additional packages and Yeah, I don't think this yeah, book is helpful for people that are like ggplot level zero. This book is confusing, actually. I think this book is really good for people like us that already know ggplot. So then we're like, oh, that's how this works or clarifying some concepts. But I don't see this working for someone that is like coming from base to ggplot. Forget it. They're going to be super confused because they, they do like that, that thing that you say, like, they give you something and then they take you back. And then they, a few chapters later, they give you the same thing that they talked about a couple of chapters later. And then they give you a little bit more of that. So you're like going back and forth. Yeah, I agree. The, but I mean, maybe the, that's something we can put as a PR or or like a suggestion. Because we had discussed suggestions and I think that rearranging, because it could be a really useful thing for new people if it were arranged oh, in a yeah. tutorial way in order. Yeah, there's a lot of good information in here. It's just that it's badly organized or poorly organized. I shouldn't say badly, but poorly organized. So I do agree. I agree with that. Yeah. If we could, like, I, I mean, they're working on a new edition. So I don't know how much they are going to take our, you know, input, but it's worth trying, definitely. If not, at least for us, it's worth thinking about because to be honest with you, I've always wanted to teach. Um, a semester or even if it's a workshop on just this let's focus on creating graphs forget about tidying data all of that that could you know i that could have been another um course another class but let's just get better or get good at um creating graphs and then this is super useful for us to sort of like um or for me at least to organize our thoughts and say, yeah, this needs to be first, this needs to be second, et cetera, et cetera. Like the outline, the overall outline, right? If not, yeah. then let me just give you this idea. I don't know, guys, if you are gonna be interested in this or not, don't even, don't worry if, if you're not. But I've always wanted to do this workshop for ESA. You, I don't know if you are members of the Ecological Society of America, since you are all ecologists. And I even talked to one of the people there and said, I would like to teach um, either at the conference or one of those um, workshops that they do remotely. So everybody's on Zoom and then they can either pay or be free. 
it depends, right? And then give this workshop, like let's talk about building graphs. I think that the three of them working together to create that workshop, oh my God, that would be, you know, amazing for people to sort of like understand how to use ggplot. So I'm just gonna leave that idea here so that, you know, we can work or we can work on that or talk about that later if, if, if you guys are interested, but yeah. Awesome idea. Yeah, I need to run, but I think we should we should revisit that thought at a future date. Um, thanks, everybody. So let's put stop in the chat.